everybody welcome and thank you so much for being here on a Saturday morning for our final day of the Delphi Economic Forum. My name is Roberto Alvarez. I'm the executive director of the GFCC. If you have not heard about the GFCC yet, you should. The GFCC stands for the Global Federation of Competitiveness Councils. We are a global multi-stakeholder organization with corporations, universities, government agencies, and private sector councils, chambers, and alike as members. We have a footprint in 35 countries today, and it's a pleasure to be in Delphi again with all of you and this amazing group of people. You know, ChatGPT writes better than 90 to 95% of the folks who I know. That's amazing. That's what I think. And we're here to talk a bit about how not just generative AI, but technology is changing, reshaping business models, jobs, skills, and society at the end. And I have an amazing group of people here with me today, starting with my friend and colleague, Chad Evans. Chad is the executive vice president of the Council on Competitiveness in the United States, where he has been leading the National Innovation Commission that the council has put together yesterday. Council president and president of the GFCC, Deborah Winsmith, who is here, has been leading that initiative and also leading things in the GFCC, coming with a series of new proposals to spearhead innovation, the innovation economy in the United States. To my right, I have Isabel Gil. Isabel is the president of the Catholic University of Portugal and one of the most entrepreneurial, I would say, university presidents, because you are now university presidents, otherwise I would say one of the most entrepreneurial people who I know in the world, <laughs> who has been not just driving the university, but changing legislation in Portugal, advancing institutions to allow for innovation. We have Venetia Cusia, a friend and partner, I would not say in crime, but I would say in different projects. And crime. <laughs> The GFCC was proud to partner with the Delphi Economic Forum and the Council on Competitors of Greece. We deployed in Athens and Ioannina in 2022, the GFCC Global Innovation Summit. Venetia, who comes with an amazing background in business, she used it to be the CEO of Manpower uh, here in Greece in the region, and now leads the Council on Competitors in Greece. And to my right, Harry Margaritis, who is one of the smart Greek tech leaders that I've met in my life. We just met, but I was telling uh, you that I had several incredibly smart Greek friends in the US, entrepreneurs who built companies, were at research, business, and it's great to see that you have returned to your country to join one of our members, Pereos Bank, that's advancing transformation and a variety of things. So, to get us started, and we'll make this very conversational, Harry, how do you see this, how do you see technology? For sure, we can talk AI, but digital technology or technology at large. Changing the bank, changing your business model, changing what you need in terms of talent, your operations. Sure. Chad, of course, when you told me yesterday you were going to ask this, I, I texted Chad GPT and I got the answer, so I, I know exactly what to say and, now. and you know, I have some questions that Chad GPT prepared <laughs> to ask you. So we, we <laughs> to be honest, I, I, I did try it, but I wasn't happy with the, uh, with the answer, so I'll, I'll give my version of it. Uh, obviously, technology is uh, fundamental in banking. It has been transforming banking uh, significantly. The way banks operate today is completely different than the way banks operated uh, even five or 10 years back. Um, uh, in order to stay competitive, you, a bank today needs to offer uh, the same experience the one gets by using uh, any application of the tech giants, uh, the quality of service needs to be uh, superior, the instant gratification needs to be there, everything has to be personalized, uh, you need to um, constantly improve your, your offerings, your capabilities. Uh, we used to have banks operating from a signal channel maybe 50 years back now, 
you have banking as a service, you have embedded finance. Um, so the, the, the world of uh, financial services is actually uh, being significantly disrupted. Um, and, and in order for banks to stay competitive and, and be able to uh, provide the, um, the customer service everyone expects, they, they need to become technology companies themselves, actually. Uh, and the, the skills you require to do that is, are, are, are so wide and, and so extensive. Um, and, and the biggest problem for a bank today, I think, is finding the right talent and the right expertise to, to do the level of change that... Uh, one requires, especially for incumbent banks that have been around for, for some time and they have uh, accumulated legacy. Uh, in, in my bank, we, we have a massive transformation program underway. We, we are delivering hundreds of technology projects every year. Uh, and to be able to do that, we, we use our, our own uh, workforce. And of course, we have augmented our workforce with hundreds of people from um, from other uh, partners and, and we have teams working in different parts of the world for us today in, in India, in Poland, in Italy, in Spain um, and how you, how you coordinate, how you manage uh, uh, those, those teams is not a trivial activity um, and, and, and also and, uh, you see that even we are two years down the line of this program and you see there is a, a need to upskill these teams as well. So because the innovation cycles now are so short that uh, if you neglect to do that, then pretty soon you, you, you'll have a, another wave of uh, big changes uh, ahead of you that you won't be able to, to cater for. Um, and, and in all that, you, you need to make sure that your own people, your team uh, remains um, uh, engaged, they see, they, they're not overwhelmed with the pace of change. Mm -hmm. um, they see their own career, their own future. Uh, and, and again, this is also not trivial uh, anymore. So the things, some of the things we're doing is we, we are investing significantly in upskilling programs. Um, as I think as most uh, organizations on the planet, we're also uh, looking at new ways of working, offering uh, flexible workspaces, the ability to work f remotely. Um, a lot of uh, a lot of our effort goes to uh, um, social uh, responsibility programs as well. Mm -hmm. uh, one of our um, uh, one of our programs called the um, Project Future um, has allowed us to to train young graduates and and uh, make the make them able to find employment. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I think we've, we've, we've done this for more than 2,800 uh, young uh, professionals uh, since 2018 when the project started. Um, so th these are all the things I think you need to do, apart from, of course, the, yeah. the hard technology aspects of having a right architecture uh, and so on and so forth. T two quick follow-up questions here, if, if you could reply to us very quickly. You said talent. Is, that, is the main challenge related to soft skills or hard tech skills? And the other thing, you said upskilling. Do you do that internally or do you have partners outside? How do you solve address I think that? That's a great question, actually. And I've been thinking about it a lot. And um, I th everyone is focused on hard skills, I, th I feel. Um, but uh, this w I think this is changing now because the, the, the importance of soft skills is becoming even more uh, um, prevalent. Um, the, the, the ability to adapt, the ability to self-manage, uh, the ability to problem-solve is not something you can um, you can easily teach or or uh, you do a four days uh, a boot camp and then uh, everyone can problem-solve. Uh, and, and this is uh, as we see this new wave of technologies, these generative technologies become mainstream. People that have the soft skills will actually be better positioned than the people that have a very niche uh, hard skill at the moment. And then, then for the training, we we do this with a, with both internal and, and external partners, of course, because the, the, the range of topics is, is extremely wide. Okay, I'll leave a question for you, not just for you, for everybody, because I want each one of you to come up with an actionable recommendation that people in, in attendance here could take home and, and do something, right? But we'll be back to that. Um, before I transition to Isabel, you, you represent to me in this conversation, 
Harry, like the demand side of talent. Isabel is in the supply side, leading a university that is on the rise. But there are two quick comments be, uh, before I transition to you. One, you are in banking. JP Morgan just, there was a research note just a few days ago saying that generative AI or the buzz around that, it's responsible for 53% of the growth in the stock market recently. Mm. That's a lot, right? So the whole bundle of companies that are in that space represent 53% of F SAP 500. That's 1.4 trillion US dollars, just around this because of the expect expectations about that. And the other thing, you said one thing, the shortening of life cycles, right? And if you want to check this out, in the GFCC we published a report on future skills. We mapped not just the skills themselves, but solutions around the globe. But when we did that, and that was in 2021, there were things that were not around, like generative AI. So Isabel, you are an innovator, you are driving change. How is your university and how are you working to address the things that Harry has mentioned, for instance? Well, uh, first of all, let me thank you for having invited me to come to, to, the, to the forum. It's a pleasure to be here and to have this discussion. And I want to say that uh, listening to Harry, um, Many, uh, one of the things that universities need to do, of course, is to be partners of the transformation that uh, the entrepreneurial sector, the banking sector industry is overcoming. We're not doing something that is apart from, uh, universities are not silos, but they are partners. And um, the uh, um, entrepreneurial sector is our stakeholder as well. For instance, you were talking about JP Morgan. Well, uh, JP Morgan, that transformation they hired the top uh, roboticist at Carnegie Mellon to lead the AI division of JP Morgan. And so, I mean, it shows that the, the science that is produced at universities is absolutely crucial also for uh, the development and the growth um, in uh, our economies. Um, now, how are we adapting our supply and the way we train our talent to the needs um, of companies? Um, you were asking earlier about technology. Technology has brought on an institutional disruption. It has brought on a disruption in our users. So the, the, uh, the students that come in, they come with skills uh, and they're technologically savvy in a way. So uh, they expect us to provide an, a value added that is not simply instrumental. Um, and it has changed also, or it's forcing a change upon the way um, we teach, so the methodologies and the pedagogy. Um, as far as the institutional transformation is concerned, uh, it has just, uh, uh, as Harry was explaining to uh, about the bank, um, and especially for multi-campus universities like my own, it has brought on much more efficiency, uh, it has brought on uh, collaboration, stronger collaboration amongst the, div uh, the diverse campi, and it has f forced or inspired us, I, I don't want to, to use the term forced, inspired an organizational renewal. And that's probably the hardest, I mean, I've had several hardest tasks in my life as president. This is probably the, the, the most difficult one. It's called Project Athena, uh, honoring the, <laughs> the Greek goddess of wisdom. And basically what we're doing is transforming the way our um, several uh, functional strands operate. Nationally, uh, bringing people to work together from the uh, diverse campi, they didn't, many of them didn't know each other, wouldn't talk to each other, and it's a cultural uh, transformation. That is extremely difficult in a university that has a strong reputation, strong legacy, um, and adding on to that, the regional differences. Uh, in my country, uh, Portugal is a small country with, with very strong regional differences. And bringing those different differences uh, to, to bear in a, a unified work environment is certainly a challenge. Uh, and bringing on, of course, new, new additions, new divisions. Um, a transformation uh, office, a happiness office, bringing all this into, uh, into the university. And it's not common. You know, mm -hmm. because universities are usually organized in very um, traditional ways. Mm -hmm. 
um, HR, finance, and that's it. So we, it, it's a complete overhaul and it's the most difficult, I would say the most difficult task um, at hand. It has forced also uh, uh, upon our faculty members a way of rethinking the way they teach. Uh, and problem-based learning is absolutely essential to bring into the, uh, um, the professional uh, world when, when the graduates leave the, the university, the ability to to resolve problems, to continue to adapt to changing uh, working environments and changing needs, uh, to be flexible, uh, to be able to integrate organizational change, and the integration of transformation and change is absolutely crucial, mm -hmm. especially in our um, uncertain uh, world. Uh, one of the first areas where we made this uh, methodolo methodological revolution was medicine. Uh, it's, of course, a, a new venture. Um, transforming from the traditional way of the lecture hall um, in teaching medicine to um, stack stackable units organized around problems. Um, this is a model that was initiated in Canada um, years ago. It is creating a revolution in the way that medicine is taught because it's based on the assumption that doctors are not fully trained when they finish their six years of college. They will continue to need to adapt, to evolve, to learn. Um, and for that, we need the methodology that uh, allows them to continue on this path. Um, and this is enlarging to other areas because uh, this will allow them to work collaboratively and continue to adapt. And this is precisely, I think, that uh, what um, um, companies uh, need. Um, having said that, I, I want to say that there was a, a big buzz when COVID hit that the traditional university, the in-presence learning university was doomed because we were all going to move into the cloud, uh, uh, professors were going to be trans uh, substituted by servers, we would have, um, um, there would be a way of uh, allowing students to self-learn through the computer. Um, that is a hype, I mean, uh, uh, In-person uh, learning is continue, will continue to stay. Technology is an add-on that will boost the way in, uh, uh, um, graduates are educated. And mind you, our function is not simply to provide useful um, uh, skills for life, that is essential, but it's also to provide wisdom and to create better citizens. That's cool. <laughs> Isabel, just, just for people to understand, how many campi or how many campuses do you have? We have four campi in Portugal and one in China. That's in amazing. Macau. And one, one thing that you mentioned, so this whole effort about transforming the university, mm -hmm. how do you train faculty? How do you train faculty to, to feel familiar mm -hmm. with this series of new tools that I, mm -hmm. I'm struggling with that? Mm -hmm. I bet a lot of people may be struggling with that. How do you address that? Well, when COVID hit, it, we all adapted immediately, but that was sort of emergency remote learning, so it's not a real transformation. But during COVID, we created a new unit um, for uh, digital learning and uh, for um, pedagogical renewal, and that is offering training for faculty in technology, digital skills. It is allowing the different schools to transform curriculum we hired also um, a tech unit for, uh, to create digital courses. So digital designers, mm -hmm. digital designers, digital educational designers are a much uh, a scarce good, let's say. It's very difficult to hire uh, um, digital designers, but they are the ones who are then transforming the content that faculty provides into online uh, videos and, and programs that uh, the students can access. So we, ha we created a, a, a unit for this. Um, and I also want to say that we believe that entering into the university, students need to have skills or basic skills in coding and programming, uh, which my generation doesn't have and that we should mm -hmm. be trained in. We don't want them to be illiteral, illiterate in that. So from this year on, um, we're providing a boot camp of Python for every single degree, from philosophy to uh, bioengineering. Everyone will do the bootcamp Python. Yep. So we, we did a lot of things with the universities in the GFCC. Um, so we researched a few years ago the toolkits that universities have around the globe to advance innovation. We mapped 52 types of tools. We compared that across dozens of universities. 
and we analyze how those tools are evolving. And tools can be tech transfer offices, venture funds, joint research centers with the industry. Those are like just free among the 52, right? And we're seeing that universities are more and more becoming blurred. So you mentioned this thing about the boot camp. I'll be back to you later because I know that you are doing that with partners outside the university. And I also want to comment that with you, Harry. But Venetia, um, Isabel just mentioned this notion of using AI and that we, we need critical thinking. We need, let's say, certain skills. We need research and that we cannot rely only on algorithms, right? Only so, on our? Algorithms, right? So you, you've been working with workforce development, empowering people, selecting, training, and now you lead the councilman competitors of Greece. How do you see all those things playing out in the economy, in the world, and in Greece? And also, uh, I have a question about your new book in a, in a minute. Okay. Uh, good morning, and thank you for the invitation. And uh, it's a constant, uh, you know, effort, and a constant pleasure to talk about skills and society for the last 25 years, for me at least, and not uh, finding any any success, I would say, we just turned the discussion on technology. And with the technology progress, we think that we have solved the mindset and the mobility of the culture. Uh, uh, we are in a constant crisis. It is a silent crisis. It is nice to talk as with the tool of technology, I will repeat. But this crisis, together with the demographic uh, problem, especially in the Western societies and in Greece and Italy, it's, it is really very, very hard and it will go accentuated. Uh, we cannot find the people with the right skills, with the right soft skills, because as already said, the hard skills can be trained. Uh, those with similar studies, let's say, and they can be trained in small courses, in short courses. The mentality to change and to look after change, both in employees and employers and the third party, has not done a great progress. Uh, employers, they require something because they know that they have to change. But they point at universities that they, they should provide the right candidates. They point at the government that uh, they should provide the right institution. What about them? And I'm not talking about bank, big banks like Pyreus that they have done things. In Greece, we have two Greeces. Uh, the Greece of the big companies and the uh, best workplaces to work, and the majority that they are small companies. They try to, to find their way. They think that uh, money is the only uh, resource that they need instead of being, you know, systematic and with the right people and uh, with the right idea and the mentality of becoming an entrepreneur. Because the fact that I'm, I cannot find a job, although they, they are scarce, doesn't make me a correct entrepreneur, not even if I have the right idea. Not even if I have the right business plan sometimes. I need to be the right staff for an entrepreneur. And I need to believe that uh, uh, complementarities will build a team that we together are going to create a competitive product or service. What we do and what we, one of the things that we try to do with competitiveness councils is to, for, to form the academia members and to try to break the silos. Because all together, academia, not only academia, but education partners, because you cannot become only through university a competitive uh, human resource. In Greece, we do have the problem of high school and vocational training. And according to uh, European ranks, unfortunately, we still rank 
among the, the countries on the bottom. So we cannot uh, empower our industries with the correct technical. Uh, and on top of that, I would say that in a way to become flexible and mobile in thinking uh, encompasses all, all parts of the society. In policy makers, uh, educators, citizens, the third uh, parties, non-for-profit, etc., all of us. This doesn't mean that all of us should think separately. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the things that COMPETE tries to do, by it, either by signing memorandum of understanding, so to sit around the table in small groups, to let the other uh, members get to know each other. If you don't know the other, you start feeling afraid or dubious or mm -hmm. whatever. After you know each other, trust starts build, building, uh, uh, being built. And understanding that by breaking the silos, you can create bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, because we also have the migration. Mm -hmm. And as we have talked yesterday, migration is an opportunity, not a threat. But migration, that it is well planned, to have the right mix, of high skills, of technical skills, or uh, whatever skills you need in a country in order to become uh, competitive, and then have the tactics and the policies to integrate them and then to engage them, to stay and become part of the society. Venetia, do you agree with Harry when he says that maybe the bottleneck is mostly related to soft skills definitely, than hard skills. Definitely, yep. definitely. The soft skills, because in my mind, apart from uh, learning to be a good member of the team or learning to be an analytical and then a problem sol solver <coughs> or learning to become flexible and not offended, when something is against you, learning to seek for the change as a, as a tool for promotion, uh, this is, is part of the family, is part of the society, the way we bring up uh, our children is part of the school and it is not one day. Mm -hmm. And Alvin Toffler had said that the uh, illiterate of the 21st century is not the one who cannot read or write or know algorithms. Is the one who cannot unlearn and relearn. This is what we need to understand. This is the kind of soft skill. I have been uh, listening to various courses, I'm sorry, but uh, it is a, a skill that uh, teaches you being uh, a team player. It is not, you don't sit around the table, okay? It, it, it's an effort. Uh, it's an effort. Instead of zero, it's one. Okay, mm -hmm. it's an effort. We play a game, let's say, around the table. And I lose. I remember my mother when I was younger, uh, many, many years ago, she said, Venetia, you need to learn how to lose. You, if you lose, you cannot be like that. I mean, it was a constant <laughs> lesson. <laughs> and this, uh, it was a life lesson. Mm -hmm. But uh, to start with, we need to start by self-diagnosing so that we are self-confident in order to be able to understand and admit what are your flaws and what you are good at in order to cooperate you need to have a life that guides you that. And the most important person is you. The others will be the helpers. So I definitely agree with, uh, with, uh, with yeah. Harris. Okay. So, you know, I, I come from a distant country called Brazil, and I lived several years in the US. And one of the biggest differences, for sure, there are lots of differences in terms of infrastructure, investment, blah, blah, blah. but. A big difference is that in a place like Brazil, you don't train leadership. 
you don't train soft skills in a structural way. It's v very, very hard to find that embedded in all systems in society. And I, I, I do agree with you guys, that makes a difference, really training soft skills in a structural uh, way. Soft skills can be trained, don't make me wrong. Mm -hmm. When you are in a company, a good company, they are going to send you, if they think that you have a career plan to become a leader higher and higher, they will train you in soft skills in INSEAD or in other uh, very prestigious uh, schools as Manpower was doing to become better. Yep. But if, a, if you have a characteristic, let's say in a scale on one to 10, if this characteristic is three, it will not by this kind of training become nine. Don't fool ourselves. If I have a characteristic which is seven, Yes, I can make it to be an eight. And definitely, as we have heard uh, during November from the Gallup president, mm -hmm. we need to focus only on the positive skills that we have to make them better. Mm -hmm. uh, this was a huge lesson in the hall at that time, mm -hmm. and it is a huge lesson for us. You brought something very important to the conversation, Venetia, that connects with things that Chad is leading and that's the notion that you don't have one economy you have different economies right not all companies will be able to hire Harry most of companies don't have access to the to this talent maybe so Chad you are leading the National Innovation Commission in the United States with Deborah in your steering committee looking economy wide right thinking about the future of the US economy how do you see this issue related to the skills landscape? One of the goals that you have set is to increase 10 times the number of people going into the innovation economy in the US. So how do you see the skills landscape changing? How do you see that affecting productivity in the economy in the world's most competitive country? You know, Roberto, as I, I sit here, well, today obviously having heard from Isabel and Harry and Vinatia and who, and maybe we were psychically connected. You mentioned Toffler and change waves. My opening point was really gonna be about, as a society, yes, in the US, but everywhere, we really are sailing in uncharted waters mm -hmm. with massive change waves coming, actually already arriving. And, and what do I mean by that? Tech, Harry mentioned this at the very beginning of the panel. Technology life cycles are shortening and technology deployment is accelerating. You mentioned ChatGPT, in addition to its impact on the stock market just over the past few months, when it was released, I think it was version uh, three, um, at the end of last year, within one month it had 100 million active users. It's the fastest growing commercial application in human history. So that means life cycles are shorter, that means um, employers, workers, students, educators, trainers are gonna have less time to adapt in this new world. It also means our foresight into the future of what is needed in the skills landscape is going to be harder to predict. So in an era of waves of this technology disruption, uh, rapid change, dynamism is going to be a critical competitiveness differentiator and uh, advantage. Uh, earlier this month, there was an Economist article about uh, touting some of the advantages or the successes in the US model. I think they called it America's astonishing record. We can argue whether how astonishing it is or isn't, but you're right, America has a lot of strengths. But a lot of that comes from the flexibility of the labor market, and the article goes on to mention um, there's so much news about layoffs in the tech sector in the United States, Alphabet firing thousands. The fact is, within days and weeks and months, most of those workers were finding new jobs mm -hmm. or they were starting new businesses. The article contrasted that with the EU where, frankly, folks are still negotiating layoff strategies. You know, the, the dynamism is not there. Dynamism. So are we on the eve of a disruption? Are we really at the dawn of a major discontinuity? Um, I, you know, we have a, a, he's passed away now, but a well-known American columnist named George Will once warned that the future has a way of arriving unannounced. <laughs> well, we've all, we're witnessing that right now. 
Who knew ChatGPT was coming in December? Maybe some people did who are in the field. I know I didn't. I know my parents didn't. I know my nephew and niece didn't. The genie's out of the bottle, is scaling rapidly. ChatGPT has completely upended what the EU has been doing on AI regulations for two to three years. It's irrelevant now. Obviated in weeks. So you talked about ChatGPT. Let's stay on that. There are many other technologies, and maybe we'll have a chance to come to that. But you know, it's already demonstrating. Um, you know, we were already worried before ChatGPT that automation and robotics were going to be replacing routine skills. I think what ChatGPT and generative intelligence, large language models are showing us is that there is the potential for non-routine jobs and tasks to be replaced. ChatGPT is writing jokes, is writing consulting reports, is writing poetry, is answering really tough questions, is scoring the highest percentages on tests already. It creates its own computer codes. Um, so, so the change is just unbelievably dramatic. Uh, there was a study released just last month that looked at what might be some of the implications of large language models. And it notes just in the US case, you, you sort of prime me to talk a little bit about the US, but I think this is probably true in a more broader sense. 80% of the US workforce today could have at least 10% of their work affected by or impacted in some way by large language models. But around 20% of the current US workforce might have as much as 50% of their work impacted by large language models, chat GPT, generative AI. And some of the occupations that might be most exposed, they're broad. Interpreters and translators, authors, consultants, financial quantitative analysts, accountants and auditors, legal secretaries, public relations specialists, nonprofit think tank leaders. So all of these AI models are just flourishing and exploring. So I want to talk, and I know our time is short, but what are some of the implications? And I, I mean this because are we going to find ourselves potentially on the cusp of the long heralded, never quite achieved next generation of productivity? Uh, a Wharton School professor um, recently posted in the Harvard Business Review, he ran an experiment. He asked ChatGPT to develop a course syllabus, grading criteria, student evaluation models, lecture notes. ChatGPT did that in seconds. Not months, not weeks, not days, not hours, seconds. And that's only going to accelerate. The scarier or perhaps really interesting thing is, what if it's not just ChatGPT, but ChatGPT enveloped by or embedded in other software platforms? So then you begin to think the implications are truly vast. So how do we come to grip with that kind of change? And, and that's really what I wanted to bring to this panel. You know, the writer no longer needs to write alone. Mm -hmm. Computer coder no longer needs to code alone. The data analyst doesn't have to research her data alone. This is a new kind of collaboration that did not exist 30 days ago. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable. So this really raises serious questions about the future of skills and what we need to do to teach and educate ourselves, much less um, the generations to come, about how will they succeed in an environment of continuous disruption. And I don't mean disruption necessarily always in a negative sense. I think it, disruption potentially has positives. But we all have to come to grips with the fact that we're not on the same technology S curve. We've jumped. We're on a new curve. And I guess the question is, how are we going to deal and live on that new curve? Not just because of things like ChatGPT. We're already overwhelmed with the tsunami of data. We're already overwhelmed with changes in medicine, life sciences, the future of biomed. So we're seeing all sorts of potential ways that we might trigger really a transformation in humanity. You know, just as the printing press um, allowed the masses to learn what only the few had learned before, and just as that same printing press brought on um, the Enlightenment, the Reformation, um, the modern university system, our current world, what's the next world going to look like? And I don't think we know that yet. Um, there was a, there's an economist in the United States named Ev Ehrlich. He used to be the Undersecretary of Commerce during the Clinton administration. And he raised a really important point. 
20, 30 years ago, he predicted, not thinking about AI or ChatGPT, but just thinking about the future, that the future would go to those who possessed an education in the liberal arts. They would rise to the top in this new world. Why did he predict that? He thought that there would come a time when it would not be so much important to you know, know an answer. The important skill would be to, write, ask, to ask the right question and then upon receiving the answer to know what to do with it, the wisdom that Isabel mentioned earlier that she's preparing the future generation for, that would be important. So it, it appears that we've actually reached the point now where we are in this age where we will depend upon and we will need to focus on amplified human creativity to really use tools like ChatGPT, much less CRISPR and many other technologies we could talk about um, to really propel human society. Thank you, Chad. You, there's one thing that you highlighted that's critical because we always adapted as humanity to technology change, but there's something new now, speed. Yeah. We never faced the change in such a hurry, right? Yeah. How are you, Harry and Isabel, in a very quick way, addressing the challenge of speed? <clears throat> the best you can do, I guess, is uh be open about the concerns you have. Seek help. You can't, uh, you can't hope to solve everything on your own. Uh, definitely you can't uh, um, also hide your head in the sand and, and wait for others to sort out the issues for you. Um, so for us, uh, we are working with uh, the industry. We are working with the academia. Um, we are preparing for the change in, in the nature of work because the change inevitably is coming. We, we see, I see it in my area already. I mean, developers, coders already, are already using it. There is, and we are seeing amazing productivity benefits. And, and I think these technologies will come, will impact every other, and, um, most of the work as, uh, as was said before. Um, I don't, I, I'm not, I'm optimistic by nature, so I think humanity will find a way to use the technology prudently, the way we have done in the past, and... Uh, but we gotta be open. We gotta be open. Isabel, how do you do that to, how do you address the challenge of speed at the university? But also, if you could very quickly comment about this blurry in your partnership to develop, let's say, digital skills. Okay. Uh, so. I would say uh, the question of, of speeds, I, rather than speed, I would say that it is important to implement in the university, in, which are traditionally, uh, let's say, slower in enacting uh, a change, a culture of transformation. And that's different from change, because mm -hmm. change is short term, transformation is something that occurs mid and long term. So that, that's what we need. And for that, speed needs to be reflected upon. You cannot uh, change just simply by dint of a uh, trend that happens. It's not, that's why COVID was important. Uh, it, we're not going to move into the cloud immediately. Change that needs, in institutions needs to be reflected upon. So we cannot fall into the trap of speed. We need to be flexible to integrate change, uh, to integrate and, and into our models um, of uh, uh, transformation. Now, I, I want to s respond briefly to something that I, I know. Oh, uh, so I'll, I'll just pass it on. I'll no, but you have a chance. Words. So yes. let, let's do one, one quick thing mm -hmm. that is from each one of you, one recommendation. How, what would you say to business, to policy, to industry, to university? Each one of you, just for us to finish. Uh, a proposal is from uh, occupations uh, market to become skills market. Uh, there has been a very nice study from Royal Bank of uh, Canada to, and has uh, come up with six clusters out of all these hundreds of occupations because what it matters for employee, employees to, to move within and between jobs is the skill. So we need to come down to see which skills can be used in what others. And second, to talk about my book, uh, is that we need to find the common 
uh, concept, let's say, to understand the other in order to communicate. This is the glossary. Okay, go from occupations to skills, the focus. Occupations to the skills, not what uh, is yep. your job, but what are your skills. Chad, one recommendation that you would give. That's hard, Roberto. I, I think what I would say is maybe um, be careful with the hype. I, I, I shared a lot of data, yep. but frankly, 11 years ago, Frey and Osborne at Oxford predicted that 47% of all jobs mm -hmm. would be obviated by automation. We're nowhere close to that. But, but on the other hand, I saw this morning, Boston Scientific's robots are now, have been coupled to chat GPT and can respond to verbal commands. That's an incredible advance in just weeks. So that can be a positive. These could be robots that help people, that can guide you in tough terrain or help the disabled. They can also, lacking an ethical framework, become very scary, dangerous tools. One recommendation, Isabel? We need to reinstate the culture of trust between universities, policymakers, and business. Work across actors. Mm -hmm. Perry. I'll go with vanity skill uh, decomposition uh, of the jobs. I think jobs need to be decomposed into skills and organizations need to start thinking which of those uh, um, activities can be augmented, which will be replaced, which need to be uh, enhanced further with human intelligence. I have three recommendations. One, let's embrace transformation. I'm getting that from you. Second, we should not fight, but we should leverage, engage with technology. It will happen. And third, as you all said, we need more partnerships. We need more conversations like this. We need to work together. Thank you so much for being here.